This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by SaneBox, the way to take control of your out-of-control email. For a 14-day free trial and $10 credit, visit sanebox.com slash macvoices. Welcome to the Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. To help us celebrate the Macintosh's 30th birthday, uh, a little bit late, Mr. Ted Landau. Ted, it's great to see you. It's great to be back, and happy birthday, Mac. Happy birthday, Mac, indeed. Where were you 30 years ago, Ted? <laughs> Buying a Mac. Good. <laughs> uh, were you that early an adopter? Yes, I was. Um, I... I... Uh, <clears throat> I, I was on the verge of buying a personal computer back in late 1983 and was debating between getting an Apple IIe or an IBM PC. And uh, I, it's hard to believe, but back in those days, I wasn't that averse to the idea of getting an IBM PC. I hadn't become an Apple fanatic, as they are now called. Uh, but, but I was leaning towards Apple because we had Apple IIe's where we worked. And, and But the rumors of this Macintosh kept bubbling up. And I said, okay, I'm going to wait and see what this Macintosh is like. I wasn't convinced I was going to get it, but I, I didn't want to make a decision at this point before we getting a chance to see it. And so it, it came out. I went to a computer store. Back in those days, they actually had Apple computer stores that weren't run by Apple. Uh, and I went to the local Apple computer store, I forget the name of it, and they had a Mac on display on one of the counters, and I started playing with it, and I just literally was blown away. I just, uh, you know, what, what we take for granted now, you know, the whole business of a desktop metaphor, you can double-click on a file and open it, uh, you can get what you see is what you get fonts and change how they look on screen, and that's how they're going to print out, and, uh, and the graphics of Mac Paint. And, I mean, there was nothing that was even close to like that before, and I just said, this is it. This is, this is where computing is going, and i got to get on this train, and I, that day I decided I was going to get a Mac uh, and, and nothing else was going to do, and I was sure that within a few years every computer was going to be like this anyway. It didn't quite turn out that way, but, but eventually it did. <clears throat> it just didn't happen in the next couple of years. The reaction to the Mac was not as overwhelmingly positive as, as my reaction, but I was still glad that uh, uh, you know I have absolutely no regrets. I got on the right train, <laughs> so uh, and it changed my life from that point on. And yes, th that was like January 25th or something like that, and I immediately went to buy a Mac. I didn't buy it, interestingly enough. I didn't buy it from that store because uh, I was eligible quasi-eligible, let's put it that way, for a educator's discount. I was, uh, I was working at a university at the time as a college professor, and Apple was giving 50% off discounts to college professors. Uh, so what was a $2,500 Mac I could get for twelve fifty? except that Apple wasn't doing it for my university because my university wasn't as prestigious enough, I guess. But I had a friend who worked, uh, I was living in Michigan at the time, and I had a friend who was a professor at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and he could get one for twelve fifty, and amazingly enough, didn't want one. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, much to my uh, uh, fortuitousness, uh, he said he'd let me have his. Uh, you could only get one. You couldn't get as many as he wanted. The discount was only from one per person. So he assigned his computer to me, which I'm not sure was entirely legal, actually. I think, uh, though Apple, I'm sure, didn't care all that much. A sale was a sale, as far as they were concerned. Uh, but I got his Macintosh, and then it took three months before it arrived. Uh, I think if I'd gone to a Apple store, I could get it that same day, but... Uh, but that wasn't uh, what I did, and so I had to wait about three months, and then it arrived sometime in April. And so I actually had my first Mac in April of 1984. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I, I remember, you know, a lot of the early Mac stuff, and you know, it was it was so new, and I was very much entrenched in the Apple II at that point. Um, not that I didn't, I, I, I never quite bought the Apple II for everything, um, because clearly, you know, there were there were limitations. Clearly, there was new software being written for the Mac that wasn't being written for the Apple II. But I don't think I jumped. In fact, I know I didn't jump on until the Apple uh, SE30. Um, right. that, that was when I got in and with the second disk drive because you know, I didn't want to swap disks. Actually, one of my less favorite um, Macs was the SC30 because it was the first one to introduce a fan. And the fan was quite noisy for my taste. And so, and so there seemed to be a lot of variability from Mac to Mac. Uh, I sound noisy, the fan was. And the one that I initially had was, in my opinion, very noisy and used to annoy me after having the, the initial Macs be so quiet. 
Ted, did it ever surprise you back at, at that time, you know, because you said you had Apple IIe's at, at work. Mm. Did it ever surprise you the lack of color? Surprise me? I'm not sure what you mean by surprise. Well, <laughs> I turned it on, there was no color. It wasn't a surprise. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah but, but I guess that, that it wasn't included, that you'd gone from, at that time, you know, the, the fairly rich graphic experience of an Apple IIe to this shades of gray computer. And, and you know, I can say that now um, because now we have all these beautiful colors. But it, it I don't know. It, that was one of the things I think that kept me from maybe adopting it early on was that lack of color. It never bothered me. I mean, you know, the Atari computer was kind of big on color with all the games that they had. The Atari 800, I think, was very popular at the time. Uh, the Mac, I mean, Mac, the Apple IIe, while it had color, um, was not something that I... Um, Took advantage of much. I mean, I the Apple IIe's that I used at work were primarily for word processing and, and some and some math analysis, and and so the fact that the Mac didn't have color didn't change things much for me. And in fact, I was happy to exchange the color for the graphic capability. You know that that you could have color on an Apple IIe, but you couldn't draw anything on an Apple IIe like you could draw in Mac Paint, which was black and white, but. But still, an astounding black and white. And the initial games that, that came out for the Mac, I remember some sort of vampire adventure game that that, that was uh, Transylvania, I think was the name. It was one of the earlier games for the Mac. Uh, it was it was great in black and white. A lot of black and white detail graphics. Again, much better than anything you'd see on an Apple IIe. And so, uh, I was happy to give up on the color in exchange for the graphic capability. It was never a problem for me. Yeah, the resolution. I mean, there's no question about that part. Um, it just, I, you know, and of course it seems kind of petty now, but that was, it was such uncharted territory. There were so many different sets of values back then. Um, and I just always found that I enjoyed the, the color of the Apple II series. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you know, the, the Mac in that way seemed a little hobbled to me. Um, and and at that time, it, there wasn't a lot of the software that I was ready to use out of the box. It's, I sort of had to wait till the SE came out to, to to find it useful. Oh, it was it was there was a lot of limitations. I mean, when I got my 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 Mac in, in April, they still had not released. You know, this was a Mac that only had a single slot uh, floppy drive. And I thought the floppy drive was cool. By the way, that was another thing I liked about the Mac that they had these you know plastic disc discs that were could fit in your shirt pocket and just sort of got sucked up into your Mac and you didn't have to insert it in, in any manual sort of way. I thought it was very cool. And I, I like, you know, I was looking forward to this becoming a standard. Uh, but it, they only had the single floppy drive and the the external floppy drive that they promised was coming didn't come till the summer or something like that, that I recall. And so like for the first three or four months that I owned the Mac, uh, I had to put up with just a single floppy drive, which was really a major pain in the butt whenever you wanted to do something like copy disk to disk because it, it couldn't the memory couldn't hold an entire disk's worth of information and so what it would do was it would copy a little bit of the disk spit it out and say insert the other disk and then it would write that little bit to that disk pop it out and say insert the original disk and you would have to insert eject and insert eject about three thousand times before you actually succeed in copying an entire floppy disk from one to the other i mean I'm exaggerating what <laughs> was maybe it was two thousand times uh, but uh, <laughs> a long number of times and uh many times i was cursing uh and it was it was a great relief when that when i could finally get a second drive for doing that sort of thing and there were lots of other limitations like that and of course as you say there was virtually no software Not Mac Write and Mac Paint and Multiplan, I think, came out pretty soon after that, and a couple of other things um, were just about all you could do. Um, but it didn't matter to me. What can I say? It's just one of those fortuitous events in, in my choices in life. Uh, I just looked at the Mac and I just said, you know, this is it. And whatever its limitations are, I'm going to put up with them because this is this is the computer that I want to be using. Ted, what and you know that that is interesting right there, and of course we're we're in a time machine right now. But what did you want to do with it? I mean, okay, you have geek tendencies just like I do. You know, we're attracted to these things. But but given that, what was it? The idea that you could get in and learn about it was it just the idea that it was you felt it was the future? What what captured your imagination so much? I guess more. Uh 
more than anything, it wasn't so much what it could do that another computer couldn't do, because it, probably it was the reverse. It was probably there was less you could do on that than the other computer that you could get at that point. Uh, it, it was an investment in the future. I was just hoping that within a year or two, the Mac would catch up. Uh, and anything that I needed an Apple IIe to do, I'd be able to do on a Mac by that point. And in the meantime, I'd be getting comfortable using the Mac. It was the, it was the operating system. Uh, more than anything else. Like I said, it was this idea that suddenly I didn't have a command line to deal with. That suddenly I, I could open a file, even if I didn't remember the file's name or where on the drive it was located, I could just you know see it on the desktop and double click it and it would open. And it allowed me um, a creative freedom uh, that a year or two later, by the time I had a Mac Plus, which is, I guess, when I were talking about 1986, uh, I think we've talked from time to time that I was actively involved back in the 1980s with a, a game called Othello. We've talked about that, I think, before. Mm -hmm. I actually became national champion for the game at one point. Uh, well, uh, during that period, I decided, um, foreshadowing some of the stuff I would do for the Mac, I guess, I decided I was going to write a strategy book on how to play Othello, because a lot of a fellow strategy, as far as I was concerned, was counterintuitive, and a lot of people who thought they knew how to win and a fellow had no idea what they were doing. So I thought I was going to help the world, at least the world of people who played a fellow, and write a little book on the correct way to to play a fellow strategy. And I did. And I wrote it entirely on a Mac. I wrote it using an early page layout program. I think it was Ready, Set, Go was the program that I was using at the time. It was a sort of page maker type program. Uh, and I included diagrams of the board, that, uh, and I laid it out with, with the, uh, with the, with the illustrations in line with the text, the text wrapped around the, the illustrations, and uh, it was a six, like a 64-page book, not huge, but a number of pages, and I laid the whole thing out and then printed it out. Uh, initially, at the time, the first copy I think I, I printed to an image writer, and maybe by the time I printed out I had access to a laser writer, I'm not sure, uh, but eventually it got printed out to a laser writer, and I took it to a print shop and had you know, like a, uh, 500 copies printed up, and uh, that was a book. I, and, I, and I wound up uh, selling the book um, to people who wanted to learn how to play a fellow. To, to produce a book like that on an Apple IIe would have been impossible for me. There's just no way it would have happened. It was only the Mac interface and, those, and that rich page layout graphic uh, you know, user interface that allowed me to do that. And I, I guess I just saw that the Mac was going to unlock things like that for me that no other computer was going to do. I haven't thought of Ready, Set, Go in I don't know how long. That's That just brings back a lot of fond memories mm -hmm. of, of early days of desktop publishing. Mm -hmm. And I certainly didn't have to do anything as ambitious as what you were doing, but it just opened up that whole new world that you started to appreciate what could be done with the machine. That was, that was probably when I first figured out just how powerful the Mac mm -hmm. was for, for things that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. by, by the way, if anybody listening to this is interested, the PDF of that Othello strategy book is still, uh, I created a PDF from, from that book, and it's available to download from my uh, personal website. So okay. I'll, I'll make sure a link gets in the show notes, because <laughs> maybe there are a bunch so, of so, Othello people out there. The door just opened, by the way. I don't know if you heard that clicking noise in the back. That was my cat opening the door. <laughs> You have a cat that opens doors. Yes, I have a cat that opens doors. Okay. And he may he may show his face here at some point. He doesn't like to be locked out when I'm in here, and so he, he opened the door and said, uh, I'm coming in. <laughs> well, the cat lovers out there will, I'm sure, appreciate this. <laughs> uh, it's not a round doorknob. It's one of those door handle doorknobs. So right. what, he, what he's learned to do is put his paw on top of the door not a handle and push down on it, and then it opens. There you go. Mm -hmm. So Smart. sounds Smart. like yeah. sounds like maybe he's training you as opposed to you training him. Yeah, or something. Yeah, something. Ted, when did you decide to get into the whole technical writing part and the and you know because I I still remember your name first becoming aware of you from Sad Max Bombs and Disasters, mm -hmm. and that you know I mean that was one of the Bibles at the time you know and and in this case the Bible of troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. Well, I had been interested in it for a while before that. I, actually, I, you know, I'm working on a talk for Macworld Expo where I'm going to do a sort of retrospective on, on my career. We can talk more about that later. Um, and I dug up the first article I ever had published, and it was a reader's tip article that I submitted. I think I got 25 or $50 for it or something like that. And what was it about? It was about how to modify the system file on a, on a Mac disk so you could customize the welcome to Macintosh message that appeared at the startup of, 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 of a Mac. 
uh, and uh, it involved using uh, this program called ResEdit, which you probably remember, and, and digging into the system file. And so even at that stage, I was already getting into the sort of this under the hood tinkering sort of stuff. Uh, and I became the de facto uh, Macintosh guru for the psych department where I worked as a college professor. Uh, and so I had a lot of trouble. You know, I built. You know, I just was interested in. It. I wasn't required for my career. It was, it was happened to a lot of people back in those days, in the earlier days of computing, where just sort of one person became the, sort of the designated hitter <laughs> for um, for for the sort of troubleshooting. And my department became me, and I was happy to just you know learn more about computers than I ever needed to do for any specific part of my job. It just became fun. Uh, and the whole business with Sad Max, oddly enough, um, began because I was writing for MacUser at the time and I wanted to become a contributing editor for MacUser as opposed to just a freelancer. I wanted my name on the masthead. I was interested in status. Not so much money, <laughs> but status. And uh, the answer, the odd answer I got was um, that people who were contributing editors for MacUser and I'd written a lot of articles for them as a freelancer by this point. Uh, and they said, you know, you don't get to be a contributing editor just by writing a lot of articles. The contributing editors bring something to the table. They have some outside status beyond the magazine that, that they bring to the magazine. And so we reward that by making them a contributing editor. Something to that effect. I don't remember what the exact words were, but that was the message. So I said, well, what, you know, what could I do? Uh, I have no, uh, you know, I'm a college professor. I don't have any, but what I do outside of Mac user has nothing to do with the Macintosh. Uh, uh, so I started, well, maybe I'll write a book. <laughs> and what would I write about? Well, uh, I'm the Macintosh guru for the psych department. I know a lot about troubleshooting. So I already have a head start. I don't have to start learning something entirely new. So I said, I'd write a book. I try to help people be able to troubleshoot their computer on their own. So the next time they have trouble, they don't have to call me. And so I said, well, maybe that's what the book will be about, a book that will empower people to be able to troubleshoot on their own so that they don't have to call somebody else the next time they need help. They can just look at this book and eventually maybe not even need to look at the book. And that was how I got the idea for Sad Max, and that's what happened. And it seems so simple and so, so obvious, but it really did set you on a path that defined a new career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? If, if they'd let me become a contributing editor right away, I might have never written a book and come in a whole different story. <laughs> you never know how things are going to develop. No. How many editions of Sad Max were there? Do you remember? Sad Max had four editions. Yeah. Okay. Over two published. Originally, it was published by Addison Wesley, and then when Addison Wesley stopped doing uh, personal computer books, uh, it got shifted over to uh, Peach Pit. Yeah, I think I probably owned every one of those and poured over them. You know, because I wanted to be able to troubleshoot things that you know, and and solve problems, and you know, it's it's again, it's that whole geek thing. I, I think that you know. So thank you for being there to help educate a lot of us. No, well, you're welcome. Uh, and I might add that 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 excuse me, that that that, um, this, that sort of tripping over serendipitous aspect of how things developed remained true through a lot of what I did. I I, I had absolutely no strategic plan for how my career was going to go. It just sort of just tripped over things as I moved along. So, you know, interesting. I think that's probably true of a lot of us. You know, right. it, 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 you look back and say, oh, I, I planned this, I planned that. No, you didn't. You know, it just that, that one odd conversation, that one odd handshake, you know, mm -hmm. or chance meeting, and, you know, your life can take a, a bit of a turn. Yeah, yeah. I'm a firm believer in that. Yeah, but at the you know at the same time, I think there there is something to be said for your persistence and your thoroughness, and, yeah. and I I think that's part of your personality, and I don't know whether that's part geek or just part Ted or maybe a little bit of both, but you know because I mean those books, Ted, you know they were I mean they were not small books, and they covered a lot of ground. Well, yeah, and again, I didn't start out saying, hmm, I have to write a 1,000-page book or something like that. I started out saying, this is in my head, saying, this is what I want to say. And I would just start typing away and say this and say that and say this and say that. And you know, wound up being 1,000 pages, and much to my surprise. Like I said, I had no, I had no, ex if, if the book had turned out, if, if you had told me when I, before I wrote Word 1 that the book was going to be 500 pages instead of 1,000, I'd have believed you. I, mean, I had no idea where it was going. It just worked out that way. So this is always kind of a strange question, I think, but people ask it anyway, so I'll ask you, do you have a favorite Mac or Macs throughout the, those 30 years? 
No. Uh, I have some Macs that I look back fondly. I'd say two of my favorites were the Macintosh 2CI. I really liked that one. That was my first color Macintosh, and, and I really thought that was really cool at the time. I liked the um, Macintosh 70, Power Macintosh 7500. It's a pre-Intel Macintosh. And I, what I particularly liked about that one, it was probably the, the most um, easily open up and modify, customizable, that's the word I'm looking for. So, I mean, you could open up the lid, completely get inside, and every, just about everything inside was easily accessible and removable. You could even remove the processor and upgrade it to a new processor if you wanted to. Uh, and uh, and I liked, again, I'm a tinkerer, so I liked the, the, the idea that I could just open it up and get in there and tinker and things. And so the 7500 was another one that I liked a lot. Um, after that, um, I guess uh, the next one that, I, that I'd be really uh, impressed with is the, one, is the laptop that I have now, the Macintosh uh, Mac, Mac Pro with Retina Display. I just love the Retina Display. so. Um, those, those are three of them. Yeah, and it's also interesting to look back at those at the plastic cases and then start to watch the evolution that the when design really started to um, and I'm, and aesthetic design, not just functional design. Functional design seemed to come first. Well, yeah, I guess it, it came borderline first, but you know we had the uh, the. Uh, See, I'm not sure which one. The silver tower that the door could open up on the side. That, mm -hmm. that, I mean, that was just amazing to anyone who had tried to scratch around inside some of the older Macs and even older uh, Apple IIs and, you know, scratch up your hand. I'm still using the Power Mac that has that design. Really? From, from 2009, yeah. The, the uh, yeah, the sort of cheese grater model, as they're called. Well, yeah, the cheese, yeah, the cheese, the cheese graters. But I'm thinking of the the gray ones before that. Ah, uh, before that. Yeah, well, the cheese grater ones open from the side, also. Yeah, yeah, but you know, and then the aesthetics, and then of course you go through the IMAX and and the colors, and you know, all the decisions that Apple made challenging the the then status quo. I mean, it really has been a remarkable ride. Oh, yeah. I, I actually I loaned a friend an iMac uh, several years ago. She finally got a new computer and. Ship, ship the old Mac back to me. Not that I really want it anymore, but it turns out it was the the goose goose lamp, uh, gooseneck lamp iMac, which is real iconic. I looked at it, you know, I was almost going to just give it away because it's really useless from today's perspective for running today's software. But I looked at it and I said, you know, this is really one of the great, again, uh, another model I guess I like, one of the great iMac designs. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm just holding on to it now for almost just museum value, if nothing else. So. Yeah, and and that's another thing about some of these devices, yeah. you know. I, I I've owned a lot. I'm sure you've owned more, but there were machines that I really didn't have a use for. But I just I wanted to own them just because of the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. You know that they they were just really beautiful machines, and you just you looked at them and said, "Wow, that's you know it it really is kind of a piece of modern art." Yeah, nobody, no other company was paying attention to design the way the way Apple was. No doubt about it. I'm not sure anybody is still paying attention to design the way Apple does, but that's a whole other discussion. Well, they, they pay attention enough to copy what Apple does. Yeah, and they usually seem to do it badly, too, <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> well, I don't know. Any, any, any final thoughts on the thir 30 years of the Macintosh? I mean, again, it's been quite a ride for you personally and for all of us that came along or jumped on board at some point. Well, the other thing I mentioned, I was t telling you about this before we started recording, I had the foresight, I guess, to save a lot of my old Mac paraphernalia. And I was going through it the other day because of the 30th anniversary stuff. And among other things, I found that in, in January and February of 1984, when the Mac came out, I bought every publication I could find that had a review of the Mac and saved it. And I have like, I don't know, maybe about 20 publications. Uh, so it's so close to that. The original 1984 reviews of, of the Mac. And I, w I wound up today running them through my uh, uh, through my ScanSnap scanner, uh, some of them, uh, four of them in particular, and then posting them online. So uh, the, the, what's really amazing is the Byte magazine review. Byte, if you remember back then, was like the, the, the was like the New York Times of personal computing. Uh, it, it didn't just cover Apple products; it covered any, any personal computer. And they had like twenty or thirty pages on the Mac, including interviews with the original. Um, Mac engineers, uh, you know Andy Hertzfeld and and so on, and 
it's fascinating reading. Yeah. Uh, you say you posted them online on your website, or did you post them to Twitter, or where can we find uh, them? Post them uh, you know, it's on my personal website. There's a, there's a, uh, I put them in my in the public Dropbox folder, and there's a link to it. <laughs> For a second there after I did, I said, I wonder if this is somehow going to my private box, <laughs> private <laughs> Dropbox access, and anyone who goes there has complete access to Dropbox. I said, you know, no, no, I don't think so. I hope not anyway. Uh, but it's in the public folder in Dropbox, and you can get a link to it from my website. Good. Well, again, I'll make sure it's in uh, in the show notes. Th- those are some things, you know, again, we take so much for granted, but it was so revolutionary. I know Harry McCracken posted, I'm sure you saw it, that video mm-hmm. of Steve Jobs uh, introducing it to the Boston Computer Society. Yeah. And it, I mean, it really, it, it really is a time machine. You know, you try to think of what you were doing mm-hmm. in 1984 and what that, what that was doing and what those people invented back then with you know, not nowhere near the tools we have now. Yeah, you know, one of the things that impressed me with that uh, video is the single-minded vision that Steve Jobs had that I think ran through his entire life in terms of developing products for Apple. And that, you know, he, he talked early on in that session about wanting the Mac to be the second desktop appliance. He said the first desktop appliance was a telephone that virtually every office desktop that you go to now, there's a telephone sitting on. And it's ubiquitous because it's easy to use. You don't need to get a 100-page manual to figure out how to get a telephone to work. And uh, and he said he wanted the Mac to be like that. He wanted it to be something that would be on everybody's desk because it was so easy to use and so, and so productive in terms of the value of it that everybody would want one on their desk. And I think that that... That idea, the, uh, whether you call it the, the telephone Mac or the toaster Mac um, or, or whatever, that idea that, that the Mac was intended to be a simple appliance that people could use uh, has infused everything that's come since. Uh, the, the, the idea of the iMac, the, the first, first advertisements for the iMac was how to, how to set up an iMac. Or something, you know, number one, plug it in. Number two, turn it on. Number three, use it. You know, that, was, that was how the ads went. Uh, and it was, again, the emphasis was this was this whole one design designed to be simple to use. Oddly, um, the Mac isn't simple to use. <laughs> it was simple to use compared to other computers at the time, and I think, uh, you know, has stayed that way in comparison to its peers. But really, the, uh, a Mac is a fairly complicated piece of device, as I keep discovering. I have a lot of friends who are uh, of a certain age uh, that I'm getting to myself, and not particularly adept at computers. And it becomes clear that learning how to use a Mac is not is not a particularly um, easy thing for a lot of people, even though it's it's quite easy in many ways. Uh, in, I, I sort of feel like the the computer that Steve Jobs would have loved to have introduced back in 1984 had the had had the technology advanced to the point that he could have done it was not the Mac so much as an iPad. The iPad, I think, is the realization of what he was talking about back in 1984. Yeah, and, and I would, folks, I would encourage you to go and watch that video. Uh, it's it really is fascinating, and I and I, I would agree, Ted. You know, at the time, it also seemed a bit grandiose. I mean, when you think about where we all were, technology wise, in 1984, to say that he wanted to put a Macintosh on every desk, um, you know, he didn't quite achieve that. But certainly, the 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 computer on every desk is a reality. A graphical interface, mm-hmm. you know, whoever makes it is a reality. So. You know, it, it has been achieved, mm-hmm. um, and I, for my money, I, I still think it's it's the Mac that is easier. But I agree with you. The appliance computer is the iPad, or it's a lot closer to an appliance computer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's still hard to try to imagine what computers would be like today if Steve Jobs had never come along. Yeah, or assembled the Macintosh team, because they really did inform so much of what has come since. Yeah, there's a sense I think that people that that you like to think that things come along because their time has arrived. You know, that even if the even if the television hadn't been invented by the person who invented television, um, I forget his name now. You 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 have a, a there's a sort of belief that within a few years somebody else would have invented the television. It, the technology was there. People more than one person had the idea for it, uh, and so it was coming. And so it isn't you know if that person didn't exist someone else would have taken his place. And I think for a lot of technology, that's probably true. Um, maybe some of it would have come a decade or two later than it otherwise came, but it was coming. 
for the for the for computers, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I'm sure we'd have computers. There already were computers before Steve came along, and computers would be a lot better now than they were back in the 1980s. But whether we would have this, the the graphical user interfaces that we have now, and whether they the aesthetic design and 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 all the stuff that comes with Apple computers that have become so emulated by everybody else, I'm not sure we ever would have gotten there without Steve. And. And you think about, and you know, we're joking, but we're serious. You know, mm. people that have tried to copy it, theoretically tried to improve it, and they just muck it up. I mean, the, you know, I, 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 I dare you to look at another graphical user interface, and I am going to put that in the category. Look under the hood. Look at all the all the settings and everything. Yeah, there's still a lot on a Mac. I mean, there's still a lot of room for mm. improvement, and but. Yeah, it's 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 hard to believe that one person and one team and one product turned so so many things and and really it has affected our lives in so many ways. Absolutely. Cuz your t- I mean your TV has a graphical user interface. Mm-hmm. I mean your 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 microwave. I mean there's so many you know you don't realize just how much that whole set of concepts affected product mm-hmm. design and control design. Going no, forward. So, some of that, some of that. I, to be fair, I, I, I don't, I don't believe that um, the microwave ovens interface is directly attributable to to the uh, uh, Macintosh computer. I think uh, that would have happened anyway. But there are aspects uh, of of how computers, in particular, work that I think were special and wouldn't have happened without Steve. Yeah, well, and I'm not saying there's a direct relationship, but I think there certainly is a certain mindset that people said, "Hey, this, you know, this makes sense." Mm-hmm. This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by SaneBox, the way to take control of your out-of-control email. For a 14-day free trial and $10 credit, visit SaneBox.com slash MacVoices. You have an email problem. I have an email problem. We all have an email problem. The experts at SaneBox tell us that 42% of email is important and 58% of email is junk or bulk. Honestly, I think they seem a little light on the junk mail percentage, but let's go with it. That means that over half of the email you get isn't really for you. It just shows up in your inbox. Sure, some of it might be from a genuinely valuable email list. Some of it might actually be a useful notice about a sale at your favorite retailer. That still leaves a whole lot of email that is chewing up your time and keeping you from getting done what you need to get done. Like responding to that other 42% or so that really is for you and needs your attention. SaneBox helps you tame the beast that is your email by automatically sifting out the bulk and the junk, summarizing it for you so you can scan it quickly just to be sure, and putting the important stuff front and center for you to deal with. It's like having an assistant monitor your email. But the assistant never gets sick, takes vacation, or asks for a raise. And with a little training, SaneBox gets even more effective at determining what is and isn't important. And it's easy to train SaneBox. A lot easier than training an assistant. Of course, SaneBox can't go out for coffee. But with all the time you save not looking at junk mail, you can go out for coffee yourself. To start enjoying the SaneBox advantage, visit SaneBox.com slash MacVoices, get a 14-day free trial, and a $10 credit when you sign up. And SaneBox is an advantage. Check it out at SaneBox.com slash MacVoices. You won't be sorry. SaneBox, the way to take control of your out-of-control email. Thanks to SaneBox for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. So 30 years later, and, and this is one we didn't talk about, but I do want to just do a quick hit on it and see what your reaction was, um, that, that apparently, allegedly, uh, Angry Birds has been used to gather <laughs> up information. As an Angry Birds player, Ted, how do you feel about this? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I browsed through some of those articles. I mean, the sense I got is it wasn't, they weren't, it wasn't suggesting that Angry Birds somehow had been focused on. I think what they were saying was that any program that transmits information about who you are and where you're located, which is what Angry Birds can do, uh, that, that the government can intercept it and, and, and use that information, or at least uh, peek at that information. Uh, that, that was how I interpreted it. And they just picked on Angry Birds for the headline because that's a very popular game. Uh, and so that got a lot of attention. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, privacy ended uh, many years ago, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, we live in a world in which there is no privacy. So, 
or at least no expectation of privacy. And at this point in the show, we'd like to say hello to the NSA and <laughs> welcome to them to our viewing audience. That's and I fully support everything they do. Yeah, <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. That's it. As long as they're listening, anyway. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's, Ted, I also want to get to uh, the, the Apple financials, and, mm-hmm. and in particular, all the chatter that's happened uh, since then, or during the financials and after, about the iPod. Um, I, I guess I'm still surprised that people seem to be surprised that there's a decline in iPod sales. Should they be? No. Mm-hmm. Uh, two things. First, I just the fact that Apple stock went down significantly today before we get to the iPods. I just want to mention that. You know, it always winds up irritating me when something when you see something like yesterday's report. Apple sold a record number of iPhones record number of iPads, I believe, as well, more than they've ever sold in any quarter. I think Macs, I'm not, I'm sure, I'm not sure if Macs were a record number, but they were certainly up there. And Apple was breaking all sorts of records, and then the result is that their stock goes down 40 points. <laughs> um, I understand it. And, and uh, you know, when I worked for the Mac Observer, Brian Chafin and I used to talk about it. And, yeah, I get it. It, it. it has nothing to do with how well Apple is doing. The stock price is all about expectations. So if you expect something to go to 100 and it only goes to 90, even if 90 is a record, it didn't go to 100. It went to 10 points less than you expect. If you were counting on that and that was baked into the stock value, then the stock goes down because it didn't do those extra 10 points that everybody was expecting. And that's the way it works. It works. It's a little bit crazy to me, but I've come to accept that that's the way it works. Um, I, I still get annoyed when a headline, you know, I think I tweeted about this yesterday, when a headline will include the word weak iPhone sales as a reason for the stock going down, as if setting a record was somehow evidence of being weak. But but, but that's the way things work there. Anyway, as for the iPod the, you were asking about, yeah, iPod sales are going down, and, and they, I don't see how they can do anything else. Uh, yeah, when it's interesting, I, I've always wanted Apple to break out the iPod Touch from the other iPods. In fact, in my view, uh, I think the iPod Touch belongs more in the same category with iPhones because really, the iPod Touch is an iPhone that, that you can't make phone calls with. That's really all all it is. Uh, it has much more in common with an iPhone than with an iPod. And I used to think when when we when when the iPod was declining, I used to say, well, you know, the iPod Touch is probably doing really well, it, it, you, and, and they're they're you're not getting to see that because it's getting lumped in with the iPod sales, which are really tanking. Because uh, I thought the iPod Touch was kind of a, a good device for Apple to have. But I no longer believe that. I think, uh, in fact, I think it's almost the opposite of these. I think part of the reason Apple doesn't break it out is because it would be embarrassing to see how bad the iPod Touch sales are. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, and part of what's changed is the ubiquity of phones. I mean, really, if you have an iPhone, you don't need an iPod Touch. And when the iPod Touch first came out, uh, a lot, you know, the iPhone was considered to be really quite expensive, uh, and, and a lot of people said, "Well, I'll stick with my Motorola, you know, dumb phone. I don't need a smartphone. Uh, I don't have to pay." But you know, at some point, well, maybe I'll get an iPod Touch so I can play all those apps, play with all those apps that, that are there. And so they'd have a, a dumb phone and an iPod Touch, and it sort of made sense. But the iPhones have, be, you know, phones have become sufficiently cheap and, and sufficiently considered essential for everybody to have one uh, that just about everybody who wants to get some sort of thing to, to have in their pocket has either an Android or, or an iPhone. It, you know, you, the, the iPod Touch just really isn't necessary if you have an iPhone sitting in your pocket. You don't, you don't need both of them sitting in your pocket. And so I think the iPod Touch has really been hurt by that. And so I suspect the iPod Touch sales are not all that good. And iPods, a little bit different. Uh, the, the iPods can still appeal to people who either don't want to spend the money on either an iPhone or an iPod Touch and, and want something quite inexpensive that, that can still cart around their music and do a few other things. Or they want something that's super compact because they're an athlete and they, and they don't want to even have to carry around an iPod Touch. And so they want something like an iPod Nano. Uh, and so, yeah, I can still see uh, some usefulness for that. In fact, my wife still prefers to use uh, her iPod Nano for listening to music and, and audiobooks. And, and as much as I have tried to tell her, you can do it all on your iPhone. You don't have to carry two devices around. She prefers carrying two devices around. So I can see it. But that's 
even all that said, I still think that the iPod sales are on the way down, as they obviously were shown to be with, with, uh, in, in the latest uh, uh, financial results. And I think, you know, I, I don't want to predict doom. I don't want to say like, like next year or two years from now, the iPod will be gone. The iPod will be gone when people stop buying it. Uh, it's a relatively, especially if Apple doesn't s devote significant resources into upgrading it, which they haven't for the last year or two. Uh, that as long as people are, are buying it in sufficient numbers that Apple can make money by selling it, they'll continue to sell it. Why not? They're not against making money. Uh, and so I think the iPod will be around, but I think it will become increasingly irrelevant. Uh, its time has passed, uh, and, and it'll, it'll, it'll be in the, in the backwaters of the Apple um, uh, inventory uh, rather than in the front. I'm surprised at how many people seem to be so anxious, like you said, to proclaim the death of the iPod. Um, and I think you said it well. It'll be around as long as, you know, it still sells. I can think of a number of use cases that it's it's good to have an iPod as opposed to an iPhone or whatever, not the least of which has to do with battery life. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you're doing something on, a, on an extended basis, mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, even an iPod Touch sucks up a lot more power than, you know, a, a Nano or any of the other currently available iPods. So it's, I mean, it has its place in history. It, it has served Apple well. It's, it's launched the, I think it launched the iPhone um, mm. because as I recall, Steve Jobs, when he announced the iPhone, that was one of the three major categories, you know, a widescreen iPod, I think it was, and mm -hmm. a personal community, what it was, an internet device and uh and a internet telephone. Device, uh, um, a phone and uh, something else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so you know, it uh, it 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 deserves the respect it deserves. But that's an iPod, an internet device, and a, and a, and a phone. Yeah, Those and, three and and so right there, you know, it, if anything, it was sort of a passing of the torch, if you believe in such things. Yeah, I still remember you know, the first attempt at combining an iPod and a phone was that Motorola Rocker. Uh, and I looked at that and I said, "Holy crap!" Yeah. <laughs> That is a piece of dog poo. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and you just knew that Apple had to do something that was better than that. And here comes our cat. Oh, good. So, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you. I mean, you're right. It, and that's that's one of those another one of those examples where somebody did it wrong, and you didn't know exactly what was right, but you knew it was wrong when you saw it, and that you had to hope that it would get better, and obviously it did. Yeah. So, anything else in the financials that? Because listen, I, I'm right there with you on the analyst. I understand it. I get it. Um, in listening to to some of the call, and I've you know, I'll let people make their own judgments. But I don't understand why analysts ask such idiotic questions, questions they know are not going to get answered. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it just is unbelievable. I saw somebody tweet yesterday. We're now in the kabuki phase of the conference call. <laughs> Where people ask questions exactly like you said. People say, you know, what are you planning for the future and expecting to get a serious answer? Oh my God, how many, how much of these conference calls do we have to go through before you get to the point of understanding that that isn't going to get an interesting answer? We well, have exciting products coming. Yeah, and and I mean they try it every single time, and it seems like it's some of the same ones. And you just you shake your head and say these, you know, these are the people who are making those predictions mm -hmm. that you know cause the stock to rise and fall. And take money in, out of my pocket, put it in my pocket. I, you know, it's just like I didn't. I didn't listen to the whole conference, but apparently, uh, we thankfully weren't treated to George uh, Gene Munster uh, asking about the Apple TV. So. <laughs> well, speaking of the Apple TV, um, you know how we all love to try to take little cues from different things, but it appears that the Apple TV has been promoted to almost its own product category in the Apple Store, uh, which... Yay! I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's if that's really important or not, but it Apple seldom does things for no reason whatsoever, so you got to wonder. Yeah, well, my, uh, the obvious guess, I'm sure everybody's guess, I'm not particularly insightful on this particular question, is that uh, that Apple is is getting ready a major upgrade to the Apple TV, or at least a significant upgrade? I don't know. If we'll call it major, uh, and that in anticipation of that they are upping its presence in the Apple Store, and maybe I, I can see our article headlines coming already. It's the end of a hobby. 
you know, this marks the end of when Apple is going to be thinking of their Apple TV as a hobby. It's now finally a real product. And uh, I'm sure that's the direction things are going. That, too, has been an interesting strategy that, you know, they've, they've postured it as a hobby. And, you know, in, in some ways, they almost snuck it in under the radar in a lot of cases because they just kept selling. It kept selling. People kept getting it. They, it kept getting better. They do upgrades. They do enhancements. But it's still a hobby. So everybody except maybe Gene Munster. <laughs> well, for, for me, the, the value from, from Apple's perspective of calling it a hobby has always been it doesn't have to justify a success. In other words, if you, may, if you call it a major product, then people can say, well, you only sold so many. Isn't it a failure? Uh, by calling a hobby, say, we don't care what, how much it sells. We're not, we're not doing this right now anyway for sales. This is just a hobby. You know, uh, it's, yeah, it's just a hobby. It's just, you know, if it sells three, we're having fun. Uh, and so, it, like you said, it can fly under the radar because Apple is claiming that the financial success of the product is not a high priority for them right now. And at some point, it'll, you know, it, 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 one or two things could have happened. Either it could have sold so poorly that Apple pulled the plug on it and said, our hobby is over, because even as a hobby, it's not doing well enough. Or it could build up to a successful point where they now say it's, it's ready to be a real product. And I think that's where we've gotten to. Yeah, I'm trying to think of its main competitors, I guess. The, the Apple TV would be, one, obviously, the, the device we're talking about. The Roku, mm-hmm. TiVo has some built-in aspects of it. Now a lot of the TVs have built-in, say, Netflix and and different things. But uh, as as a standalone set-top box, I would think the Apple TV would have to be, you know, in first or second place. Probably first because I can't right off the bat. I can't think of a second. Yeah. From articles I've read, I think it's first place. Roku would be second. Yeah. So. That that puts it in an interesting position, and I would think gives Apple some leverage to negotiate with the powers that be from the content side. And the big draw that Apple TV has, you know, like you said, smart TV. You know, I think you know, my toilet can can do internet uh, streaming these days. I think I expect to see Netflix, you know, when I flush uh, up here, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, every everything is doing it. Uh, so you know you need something to make your your device stand out. And Apple has a built-in advantage in that. It's still the only device that easily integrates with your iTunes library for for playing your music and videos that you have in, in iTunes on your on your TV. Uh, the um, AirPlay works great uh, as a means to get anything that's on your Mac onto a, a large screen. I use it often actually it's, it's a really great feature and so there are some things about apple tv that you can't do with other devices but still from a channel point of view in terms of you know having netflix and hbo go and and things like that um there are lots of places that have those same sort of channels or more than than apple tv has and so i i think it's getting to the point where i where i believe if Apple wants to keep uh, keep the Apple TV competitive, it has to look to see how how is it going to answer all these other devices that are that are challenging it in terms of all these channels. And, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. I'd like to think they're going to actually have a, a store where you can buy apps specific for the Apple TV. I, I wanted to see that. I think it's hampered by that. We've talked about this before. I think it's hampered by the fact that there is no internal storage on the Apple TV. So you can't download an app like you can to an iPhone. Uh, but uh, I know there are ways around that, uh, and, and I think Apple may be working on that. We'll see. The one other piece that I think is greatly overlooked um, by by so many people in the Apple TV is the remote. I mean, the remote is is easy. Anyone can use learn to use the remote. Pretty much anyone. Um, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, they're it, they've taken. The, all the buttons that are on your TV remote and my TV remote, and they've kind of transferred a lot of them to uh, on-screen menus, mm-hmm. which I think, frankly, is a lot more satisfying because they can be a lot more self-explanatory. Mm-hmm. So I, I just feel like, you know, that's one mm-hmm. thing that I, I think Steve had a big hand in that is keeping it simplified. And I firmly believe that that makes a huge difference when it comes to uh, how people interact with this device. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you exactly. if you agree or not. Yeah, I don't think it's the uh, uh, the the 
pick a selling point for, for Apple TV by any means. If it has slightly more complicated remote, I don't think it would be the, be the end of the Apple TV, but, but it's certainly nice. But for me personally, the remote almost doesn't matter because um, I, tr I have a Logitech Harmony remote, and one of the first things I do when I get any device is try to figure out a way to run it through the Logitech so I only have to deal with one remote. So I'm, never, I'm not using the, the, uh, built, the Apple included remote much anyway. But it is it is a very nicely designed remote. I agree. I, I guess you know we once again we just have to wait and see. But it feels like the the future for Apple is at least as bright as it was in 1984, and probably brighter because now they're driving a, a tank full of cash. <laughs> tank full is an understatement. Uh, a small country full of cash, but. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, I think it's going to be an interesting year for Apple. Uh, uh, I, I think this may be the year. Well, we've already seen it with the with the introduction of the Mac Pro at the end of last year, which is a radical new product, uh, even though it's a very expensive one. It's certainly not a trivial redesign of the existing Mac Pro. And uh, I think these that sort of major product in, introduction uh, and redesign of existing products, I think this is going to be a big year. For that. I think it's, that's not the end of, of the major uh, announcements that we're going to see this year. Well, that means we'll have a lot to talk about going forward. Oh, yeah, I think so. Great. Ted, happy 30th Mac anniversary, birthday, something, I don't whatever's appropriate. It's great to see you. Thanks for the time. Uh, it was good talking to you, as always. We'll do it next time, too. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Notables on Mac Voices, and we will be talking to Ted Moore. We'll be talking to a lot of other people more, and I hope you will join us. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date with all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.